Hello. Everybody knows the formula for solving quadratic equations, but do you know the formula for solving cubic equations? It's a pretty little piece of mathematics, which um, isn't taught very widely. Um, but more than that, it's uh, regarded by many as the sort of beginning of modern mathematics, because it sows the seed for the development of complex numbers and also for another branch of mathematics that I'll come to to the end. So my plan for this video is uh, to show you that pretty piece of mathematics and solve cubic equations for you and then see how that led to developments, further developments in mathematics, particularly complex numbers. So let me share my screen. So there's my title. And let's start with solving quadratics. So that's a typical quadratic. We're going to assume that the coefficients are rational numbers. Um, it's a bit more complicated if you don't make that assumption. But um, Right, so the rational numbers, uh, we might as well assume they're integers at this point. Uh, and, and here's the formula, which everybody knows and loves. Um, so this formula is very, very old. It goes back uh, to 1800 BC in Babylonia. So that's one and a half millennia before the classical age of Greece and people like Euclid and what have you. It's a very, very old formula indeed. Uh, but it led nobody to develop complex numbers. Um, we had to wait over 3000 years for the similar formula for cubics. Um, so it must have been a lot more difficult. But why didn't it develop, lead anybody to develop complex numbers? Well, I think there are three reasons. First of all, what's the point? So if you have a real problem in geometry or mechanics or something, and you boil it down to a quadratic equation, and the determinant of that quadratic equation is negative, so as we would say, it has only complex roots. What that tells you is that it doesn't have any real roots, and the original problem doesn't have a solution. Well, that's the correct, um, that's the correct deduction. Uh, so why would you go any further? I think the second one is probably that um, even negative numbers in Europe were still regarded as absurd or imaginary until actually to the 18th century. Um, so, you know, there, even then, the century after Newton, there were people who didn't really hold with negative numbers. And the third reason is that sooner or later, if you start thinking about complex numbers, you run into this paradox, um, which uh, you see all over the internet every now and again. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, we, we can resolve that. We'll see that later. But, but anyway, even if you start playing with complex numbers, you hit that and then you throw your hands up in horror and give up. So nobody ever did it. Right, so now let's move on to cubics. The first person to did this, do this was this Italian Scipione del Ferro in the 16th century. Well, I guess it was the 16th century. We actually don't know quite when he did it because he never published it. But eventually uh, news spread that he had a solution and uh, other people found a solution. And uh, it was eventually published by this guy, um, Cardano, uh, with attribution um, uh, to, to Del Ferro. But um, it's still nevertheless rather unfairly known as Cardano's formula. Um, I'm going to call it Del Ferro's formula. Right. Uh, so here we go. Um, here's our general cubic. Um, and uh, again, the coefficients are going to be rational numbers. Um, so the first step is um, to divide by a to create what's called a monic cubic, like that. Um, and the next step is um, to make this substitution um, to essentially shift the, cur the, the graph uh, parallel to the x-axis a bit. And the point of that is if you make that substitution, you get rid of the x-squared term and create what's called a depressed monic cubic. Um, and just to make my formula fit on the slides better, I'm going to make this substitution. So P is going to be 3R and Q is going to be 2S. So we'll end up with that version. And lots of people before Dale Ferro had got as far as that, but and actually that's not the point. That's just a bit of simplification. But before we go any further, let's have a look at um, a cubic like that from a modern perspective. So here is a depressed monic cubic and the graph. So Dale Ferro didn't have the idea of graphs. Um, to be honest, they didn't really understand even the functions at that stage. Um, and negative numbers are pretty tricky. So uh, this is way beyond anything he could do. Um, so we can imagine what uh, various versions of um, what a depressed cubic looks like. Um, in particular, you can see that the tangent at the origin um, makes it fairly clear that, um, that the point of inflection is when x is zero. Uh, I'll get rid of the tangent now. We can see that if we use calculus, which of course is a century after Del Ferro, 
we get the derivative like that. And again, we see 3R then is the, is the gradient of the tangent at, um, at x equals zero. And the second derivative is just 6x. So it's zero at x equals zero. So it is indeed the point of inflection. Now, it turns out we can assume S is negative. There's a sort of symmetry involved. Um, and if we assume it's negative, then we've always got one positive root, one positive real root. There it is. Of course, if R is positive, uh, then we've only got one root, in fact, we haven't got any turning points. If R is negative, then at least we have a maximum and a minimum, um, and we can work out where they are. So the local maximum is going to be at this number. So remember, R's got to be negative for there to be one, and, and here it is, and um, S and Y is that. So one of the interesting questions then is, um, when are there three uh, real roots? Uh, so it's when this number is positive, isn't it? If you work through that, it turns out there are three real roots when this quantity is negative, s squared plus t cubed. So remember that s squared plus t cubed being negative gives us three real roots like that. Okay, um, so let's summarize that. Um, with the depressed monic cubic, we have a point of inflection when x is zero, of course, this x squared um, being zero also means that the sum of the complex roots is zero, but we don't really need that. Um, we can assume s is negative. Um, there's always at least one positive root. And this key fact, there are three real roots if and only if s squared plus r cubed is negative. Okay, so now let's go on to um, Del Ferro's genius step, which is this. So we let x equal u plus v. Uh, well, on the face of it, um, that's a very bad step because now we've only got one equation for two unknowns. But okay, let's persevere. Um, so what? See what happens. So x cubed becomes u cubed plus v cubed plus three uvu plus three uvv, and this thing here turns into r times u plus v. Now the good thing about this setting x equals u plus v is that it gives us a degree of freedom. Um, so let's use it. And let's say, well, we're going to assume that this is true. So we're going to seek a solution to this equation and that one, which now simplifies to this when that's true. So that's actually quite nice. Where do we go from here? Well, we can substitute for V from this equation to this equation. V is minus R over U. So we get that. And now we can multiply by U cubed and get that. And what's that? Well, beloved of all A-level students, what this is, is a disguised quadratic equation for u cubed. So we can solve it using the quadratic formula. And there it is. That's u cubed. Uh, v cubed turns out to be that. Uh, this thing here, we can take the cube root of that. And there we are. That's the solution of a cubic equation. Isn't that pretty? Well, it is, so long as this thing's positive. Then this is the square root of a positive quantity, and this is the cube root of a real thing, and we're away. Um, so this works beautifully when this is positive, but remember that means there's only one real root. So let's just summarize this. Our solution is this. You already see it written like that, in fact, Del Ferro wrote it that way, and that works fine when the, this thing here is positive. But when it's negative, um, and we're working with complex numbers, uh, this way of writing it makes it look as though there are nine solutions, uh, three to that and three to that. But of course, they're connected by that. So. Um, We'll stick with that. Right, now then. So what we've discovered is if there's only one real root, um, it, and it's positive, of course, Del Ferro's formula will find it. Fine. If there are three real roots, but no rational root, if there's a rational root, the, the, the polynomial factorizes, of course. Um, so if there's no, ra no rational root, it finds none of the roots without taking the cube root of a complex number, which is completely impossible for Del Ferro. I mean, he was probably pretty doubtful about negative numbers, let alone complex ones. I don't know about that, it may be unfair. That Cardano bloke um, who published the thing first, he was the first person to systematically use negative numbers correctly. So, and he was writing after Del Ferro. And the interesting thing is that if you take, if you sort of pretend you understand complex numbers and play with the idea a bit uh, with real imaginary parts, and you set up equations for finding the cube root of a complex number, um, the one that appears in, in Del Ferro's formula, uh, you end up back with the original equation. So you go around in circles. So 
This is why it's called the casus irreducibilis, the irreducible case. You can't get rid, you can't get anywhere. You can't get make progress towards those real solutions that you know are there. Um, so what that does is give you the motivation to make complex numbers work, at least to be able to the point of taking their cube, cube roots, because here are some real physical problems which have real proper solutions, but you can't find them without without discussing, without taking the cube root of a negative number. It's not amazing. So that's what kicked off complex numbers. Um, and let's just have a look at some examples. So um, here is uh, the case with only one real root. Um, so here it is. It's it's a bit complicated. It's not too bad. It's this cube root plus that cube root. Uh, these are real numbers. So this is the ordinary cube, real cube root. Um, these are the other two roots, which are complicated, but they're not impossibly complicated, actually, if you think about them. So this component here is that bit multiplied by one of the cube roots of one. And this one is that one multiplied by the other cube root of one. And there we are. And they're, you know, they're complex conjugates. Of course they are. Right. So let's move on to the the Cassos irreducibilis. So this is the positive real root. It doesn't look obviously real. You can convince yourself if you understand complex numbers that this one is real. This one is <clears throat> horribly complex. And you it's not at all obvious that either of them is real. Um, in fact, Mathematica doesn't realize they're real. Look. <laughs> Um, so even with uh, this mathematical thing here, oh, by the way, this bit in Mathematica means use Del Ferro's formula um, and simplifying it. It can't simplify this to a real number. It just doesn't get it. Right. So despite there now being a strong motivation to get complex numbers to work, progress didn't wasn't overnight by any means. So sort of a century and a bit later, Leibniz was saying, well, complex numbers are sort of nonsense, really. You don't know, won't have any truck with them. Euler, ever always Euler, Euler, always comes back to Euler. He was the guy who really got them working. Um, and that's sort of, um, well, two centuries later. Um, he's famous for introducing I as a symbol for one of the square roots of minus one. And, and I think that's, well, we'll come back to why I think that idea is more important than, uh, than it might at first seem. But anyway, he built the whole structure, including this thing and, um, and his famous formula, e to the i pi is minus one, which of course is just, special case of that um and then um but he did that without having the complex without having an argand diagram because that didn't come till later um so casper vessel was the first person to do that and then argand did it again um i don't think he cheated he just independently discovered it um and and then um koshi uh invented complex analysis pretty much all on his own from 1814 or thereabouts he started publishing and so the reason that in complex analysis there are so many things called Cauchy formulas and Cauchy's equation and what have you is because he did do the whole thing pretty much um, and 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 around that time the world got the hang of it um, and and it was became a part a standard part of mathematics so why did it take so long <clears throat> I think there were three key enablers to all this one is algebra um, so Del Ferro's genius step would be very hard to do without algebra with the idea of making letting x equal to the sum of two things and getting those two simultaneous equations could you do that without algebra well i suppose you could but it'd be jolly jolly hard so that's an important enabler the power of a good notation of course this i business um it makes it much easier to get started so it deals with that that paradox we talked about before completely i mean it just isn't a paradox anymore uh there are two numbers whose square is minus one there's that one and that one um so that's easy so, uh, but the point about this is that if you use the square root of minus one, whilst you're beginning to set up the concept of con complex numbers, you have that original paradox built in right from the beginning, and you sort of get stuck. Whereas if you set aside the business of the square root of minus one, and you say, oh, let's have an i whose square is one. Oh, well, then minus i square will also be one. Um, and you can build the whole structure, and then you come back to square roots and say, hmm, so square roots are a bit complicated with, square, with complex numbers, aren't there? There isn't the square root of a complex number. There are two, and we can't really tell them apart. So um, that's a very important. And the other, of course, important enabler is a good diagram. Um, so it's impossible to imagine Cauchy um, inventing contour integration, for example, without having the access to the Argand diagram. 
Okay, so there we go. Um, so the final chapter. Um, so I, I mentioned right at the beginning that this led to another development in um, mathematics, modern mathematics, which is what's called algebra at university, things like fields and groups and what have you. And in particular, what we now call Galois theory, named after Ernest, uh, Everest Galois. Um, so let's just follow that story. So there is a quartic formula as well, which is discovered not that long after the cubic form. It's much more complicated. And so that began sort of three centuries of um, attempts at solving quintics um, and they failed, everybody failed. Uh, and eventually it was proved that you could not do it. Um, in other words, there is no formula using radicals, square roots, cube roots, what have you, for quintics and beyond. That was first almost proved by Ruffini, but not quite. And this guy, Arbel, um, finished it off. Um, and it's, that's called the ruffini arbel theorem. The other thing that emerges from that is that there is no general solution in real radicals, even for cubics. Um, in other words, this business of having the cube root of a complex number is inescapable if you're solving cubics. So the casus irreducibilis will remain irreducibilis forever. So there we are. I hope you enjoyed it.